But in the meantime, we have material to cover. And uh, folks will require that um, last time we, uh, I made some introductory remarks about uh, coverage testing. Um, this is a, a procedure that is uh, widely popular within testing, particularly testing at a system level, but also at a unit level in a white box sort of way, uh, glass box sort of way. Um, and uh, there's two forms of it we'll be covering in this class. One, uh, yeah, so transition f will be a form of what's called path coverage. And path coverage is um, one of the two types, broad types of, of uh, uh, of, of coverage that we'll be speaking about. The other will be something called logic coverage. And for each of these, basically, as I noted last time, we're going to identify the set of things we need to cover, find the set of scenarios. For example, today our focus will be on paths, as it will next time, um, that will cover these things we need to cover. And finally, find a set of very concrete test cases specific inputs that will exercise those scenarios. Okay, so the things we may want to cover might be transitions, nodes, particular logic conditions. Um, and uh, we're going to find a set of abstract scenarios that cover them. In this case, it will be paths from start to finish. And then we're going to figure out how do we get it to follow those paths? Like, how do we get it to go this way? And then around here, and then finally up and finish. We'll come up with particular test cases, very specific inputs that will exercise those scenarios. And we saw last time how we could characterize um, systems of different sorts with diagrams, with graphs where we have edges and nodes. Edges sometimes represent transitions, say transitions between states or between modes of user input. And vertices often reflect kind of a current state of the system or a current mode it's in, a current screen it's on, a current page that it's currently on in a web app. And uh, the exact form of these diagrams will differ for different, different types of systems. So here's for an ATM. We talked about it a bit last time. This is for uh, glass box unit testing within a given function. And I give a reference to exactly this being done at a branch level, at a transition level. Uh, within Excel back in the 80s. Um, but uh, in either case, we can diagram it out at an abstract level as vertices and edges, uh, transitions. Um, now, path coverage techniques, the first of these two techniques, broad sets of techniques we're going to be covering, um, will be a technique that focuses on driving paths through the program from the start to the finish or to any finish that will exercise a given level of coverage. So we'll be talking about several variants of this today and, and uh, in the next lecture. Probably for the next lecture we'll be reserving prime paths because that's a more involved one that I don't think we could both start and finish today at top the two others we'll be starting with. Um, but today we'll probably go through state coverage, which might include state meant coverage for, for your sorts of um, concerns, uh, and, and transition coverage. Okay. And then we'll, we'll go through some higher level paths like round trip paths or um, prime paths focusing on that latter one uh, during our, our next lecture. So the goal here is, look, we're going to identify these things you want to cover. And then we've got to find paths that will cover them. And then we have to find specific
specific concrete inputs or you know, set up the situation such that it will go in those paths. Okay? And I had noted last time that there's a subsumption hierarchy there. Okay? Uh, this is one of many such hierarchies you see in computer science. And last time, I given reference to what this means. What, what do I mean by a subsumption hierarchy here? So you'll see here node coverage at the bottom, a little bit further up edge coverage, and then further up yet, edge pair all the way up to find paths, which will occupy us next time. What do you think it means? Based on my comments last time from this floor, um, what do you think it means that node coverage is, is beneath edge coverage? So there's an arrow from edge coverage to node coverage. Uh, yeah, Mason. So to get to all the edges or all the nodes, or to do all the edges, you are going to reach all the nodes. That's exactly right. And, and you phrased it carefully and with good reason and accurately. And I, I, I want to uh, praise how you describe it because you took the care that was necessary. Achieving edge coverage of necessity, as long as each node is connected via some edge, if you do edge, if you achieve edge coverage, you will have achieved node coverage. But almost always, you've achieved more than that. You, you, you've tested it additionally, but you've gained node coverage at the least. Similarly, edge pair coverage, you've achieved edge coverage, but you've, you've provided stronger guarantees yet. Okay. It doesn't know the hardware of my virtual machine. Um, okay. Um, prime path coverage will guarantee for us both edge coverage and node coverage and edge pair. Um, and you'll notice that this is what we call a post set. It's a partially ordered set. Why, why do I say partially ordered here? Why isn't this a, a total order? Well, total ordering, we might think of something like integers under less than or equal to. So every integer is either A is less than or equal to B or B is less than or equal to A or both, right? If, if A equals B. So why is this not a total ordering? Like, there's multiple different nodes on the same level. You can't really yeah, them. yeah, yeah. You can't really compare. Like someone could ask, how does complete round trip coverage compare with edge pair coverage? And you, it turns out that you can achieve edge pair coverage without achieving complete round trip coverage, and vice versa. Like, no one is better necessarily than the other. There are cases where you achieve the one on the right here without, so you achieve complete round trip coverage without edge pair coverage and, and vice versa. Um, and so no one guarantees the other. Um, and there may be sometimes multiple things that guarantee a given one. For example, all use coverage will, will guarantee edge coverage, as will edge pair coverage. Those are two ways we could generalize, as it were, edge coverage to, to be stronger yet, to, to cover more things. But neither of them are subsumed by the other, okay? So um, this is all deaf use pairs, the D one, which plays a, a notable role within compiler um, reasoning, okay? So here we have this subsumption hierarchy. It's, uh, it indicates when one thing is stronger than another in the sense that the weaker thing is fully exercised by the stronger thing, but the stronger thing does, does more. Um, and there are similar hierarchies for things like languages, uh, um, uh, levels of languages. And, and if you take 3, not the 364, you'll hear about, hear about that. We have many of these sort of subsumption hierarchies, these post sets within computer science, um, which, which demonstrate partial orders, okay? So node coverage or state coverage, you can use different phrases for it. By the way, this is from an excellent book by Amin and Offit called Introduction to Software Testing. And that's organized, a lot of it is organized around this issue of coverage, coverage techniques. 
And I'd, I'd recommend it um, uh, very strongly as a, as a book. It's, it's really good and it's thoughtful and it's, it's got some really practical science to it. Okay, so state-based coverage. Um, uh, here, if we have the system where we, we talked about it last time, where we have tickets being made, being paid for, and being fully ticketed, the actual ticket is issued. Um, and then we have a, a set of canceled states that can be in. Um, canceled by the customer, canceled due to non-payment. So canceled by the customer, the customer proactively said, I'm gonna cancel this, I want a refund, or what have you, and cancel it. Otherwise, because of non-payment for a period of time. And finally, um, whether it's it's uh, used or not, you know, maybe used. Here, we could imagine a small number of scenarios that achieve state coverage. And, and those are, those scenarios are illustrated with the thick black lines, right? So uh, we have, for example, a scenario that goes through the typical case or the desired case, often the case that we as software engineers like to think about where things go right. Software engineers have a very bad tendency to focus on the case where things go right and to not properly handle the cases where things go wrong, sort of the unusual case, but often it's just as important. So here, a ticket is made, paid for, ticketed, and it gets used, and things are all, as they might have said when I was young, hunky-dory. Um, by contrast, but does that cover all states in the system? That path? This, this path here? Are all states covered? No. We haven't exercised any of the canceled states. So, so that one scenario, whilst it covers four of the states, four of the nodes, yeah. Um, there's there's some it does not uh, does not cover. Uh, these canceled ones. So we need at least one scenario to cover. But I want to emphasize, in general, a scenario will cover many states. I mean, we want to cover states here. We want to cover these nodes. And it's fine that a scenario, and it's to be expected, a given scenario will often cover more than one, right? So, so we have this scenario covers both. Great. Now we need another scenario that, that reaches the state canceled by customers. So what are we going to do? Well, we basically have three possibilities. What are the three possible ways of at this abstract level of paths through the system, these, these paths through the system, these legal paths through the system, there's three ways of exercising the state. What are three ways of exercising the state? One of them is shown. Number two, well, what are the three? Yes, come here. You could go through the paid node or the ticketed node. That's right. So you could go made and then just cancel before you pay. Or you could go made, paid, cancel. Or you could go made, paid, ticketed, cancel. Any of those will achieve the goal of testing this node, of having reached this node. I mean, look, if you, if you never reach this node, how do you know the system operates properly in this node, right? I mean, how can you pass the red face test and say, yeah, we tested the system? You know, it's operating fine even with cancel, you know, customer canceled stuff. You can't. You, you, you need to be able to exercise that. And in this case, we exercise one of those paths. We pick one of those abstract paths, start to finish, through the system that, that exercises this node. And you'll notice that this path goes through made again. Path one did, the, the, the hunky dory route. And this route, uh, which had some issues, you know, the, the customer cancels it, it's not so hunky-dory, it, it also goes through made. Well, yeah, that's not a problem. I mean, yeah, so we're exercising made more than once, fine. The thing is we need to, every one of these nodes, we need to, to exercise at least once. And so the fact we've done this twice is not a big deal, the made. Okay, 
Now there's one more state we have to cover, which is this canceled non petty one, right? And here, um, we really only have one possible path. We go here and we come down to uh, pay time um, expires. So here it, you know, it, it expires because we make the ticket and then within mumble number of hours, eight hours, we don't tick, we don't uh, proceed to payment, so we'll just cancel. Yeah, Mason. Well, this is a thing. This is why we're going to be talking, like, for this level of coverage. Well, we'll see this. I think there's a slide that, that's coming up. Excellent question. And what you're pointing to was the subject of a stentorian utterance by me last time. Okay? Um, uh, Sam likes that phrase. Um, uh, and um, in that oration, basically what I said is that Exhaustive testing is almost always impossible. So we cannot formulate a test case that's feasible, you know, it's not feasible to exercise test cases which um, are formulated for every possible round trip path through, through a, a system. You know, every possible runtime circulation, loop, for example. We can't say, we're going to have a test case when it executes zero times around the loop. You know, it falls through the wild. And another one where it's once, another one where it's twice, another three times. That can be an arbitrary number, particularly in a system which has, you know, user input. It's just a read eval print loop. It just cycles around. You're not going to be able to execute that arbitrarily many times. So what these systems do will approximate that with different number of times. In this case, all you have to do is reach it, all the nodes, once, and you're done. And yes, you haven't exercised each number of times you go around, but if it, you've at least reached all, all nodes. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll um, uh, I, I can go back and, and talk about this. So let's talk about this one, right? Um, so if I wanted to have state-based testing for this one, um, you'll notice that this, this uh, loop here is looping through this string. It's going and it's looking at each character and then it's at the end here, it's incrementing the character at which it's looking. So it's going through each string and it's encoded one and basically successively decoding it into to here. And it's doing this with these pointers um, as we would in C, okay? So it's looping through and to achieve state coverage or node coverage of this, um, we're going to need to hit every one of these states at least once. Now, how many times are we going to have to sort of characterize how many times in our test cases will we actually have to go through here to achieve that level of coverage? What's the minimum number of times we would have to come through under this while and go into, say, block C in order to achieve state coverage logically here? So we need a test case that's going to exercise this. Could we exercise all of these states with an empty string? I mean, a string with nothing in it, it's length zero. Can we, we do that? Would that exercise all of the states in the system? Okay, why not? Where would an empty string go? Anyone want to say? For those in the back, I regret I didn't bring you Benanto. And hopefully your eyes uh, carry yet the clarity of youth. Um, and so hopefully you can see it. Write, write, write that one down, Sam, too. Um, <laughs> record it again, Sam. Um, so, uh, so, so um, with that, that youthful uh, clarity and one hopes vigor as well, um, uh, can you see how many times if it's an empty string, how many times will it, will it uh, go through this loop here? Yeah, what, what will happen? If it's an empty string, uh, with or will it go? Yeah, 
out. Where will it go? So if it's an empty string, it'll hit A, it'll hit B, and where does it go from B? It goes to false. It goes to M. Hmm? It, it'll go to M. Has that exercised all states? Most assuredly not. Hmm? I don't know why they don't hire me over in English. Um, uh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, to exercise all states here, how many times, what's the minimum number of times our test case will we'll need to, what's the minimum number of characters that will need to be in our string to possibly execute this in a way that will reach all states? Why don't you think about that for a minute? If you want, turn to your partner. Engage in, in reflective conversation. But try to figure out how many, how many characters would you need? And more than that, can you give me a description of which characters you need to, to go all the way through it um, to achieve state coverage? Can you give me at least a case where you can go through it and achieve state coverage with this thing? Um, with your with the string that you have in mind, or if you want, you could give me more than one string. That's also fine because you know different strings might execute different subsets. But try, how about give me one string? Try, give me one string to achieve all this. Come up with a string that's kind of a minimum length string. There's no string less than that where you believe it will achieve achieve this. Struggle with it for a minute. This is not, ladies and gentlemen, to the relief of our absent colleagues, this is not a pop quiz. I repeat, this is not a pop quiz. Okay? For those who cannot reach it, this is a false and this is a true. intensity of your discussions. Mm. Mm. Incidentally, OK is being used to signal an error condition. This, I'm, don't name your things like this, okay? Please do not name okay and, and just give a zero and one to it. This is like, this is abusive C coding. Um, so okay equals zero means it's fine. 
and OK equals 1 means it's, means it's bad. Are you OK? Yeah, I'm OK. I'm really horrible. You know, I guess I'm told that, that young people sometimes use sick to mean good. Um, but now I'm told that I'm, that's outdated <laughs> something else. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, OK, so, so ladies and gentlemen, um, does anyone want to, to advance an idea? Mason, I, I admire your, uh, your, your volunteering. That's excellent. And then an A. Oh, no. uh, uh -huh. Plus an A. Plus an A. Okay. Okay. So so let's let's see if we can uh, write out that. I believe that that would achieve coverage. Um, but is it the minimum? Okay. So let's 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 go that. Did you say plus percent? No, plus A. Oh, uh, plus A. Okay. Plus A, and then a percent. And then a percent. Mm -hmm. And then what's two legitimate characters? One D. Oh, let's let's do two zero. That's space. In my youth I would have known what one D is, but but um, I uh, ASCII is fading in my mind, um, if not in practice. Um, okay, and then and then you would said maybe a percent with two Bad characters? Yeah, so so things that are not hex values. That's what this is determining. You know, sort of read between the lines. This is why I don't recommend treating this as model code. Although I'm told that in some classes the code that is presented is not much better. <laughs> don't take it. As, don't take it as your model, okay? Um, uh, so, so hex values presumably looks up whether this is a. <laughs> I'll be um, whether whether this is a legitimate uh, hex value and and otherwise it will. Uh, uh, if not, it will be minus one, right? So this this might be percent sign I don't know something like that um, right um, and and then and then you said uh, plus did you say or I guess in just an A okay just okay so just an A would lead it to here. And then it would lead it over here, right? No, the plus. Uh, uh, sorry, the, the true. This is plus true. Oh, sorry, the plus. Yeah. yeah. So it, it would lead it here, and then it would lead it here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. Good. 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 So just an A. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so so let's let's go around, right? At first, you're going. You went, you went down here, right? And then the A went down this one, and you said false. It went here, went false again. It exercised that. So we're kind of ticking off these, right? We've done this, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. And, and now we've done this, we've done this. But we have yet to penetrate this unsafe code. Right? So I go up and I come down and then I have a false because it's not plus, it's going to be percent, and then I have a percent and it goes to true, and then I'm going to parse those two digits to zero and things are, are it's a happy camper, um, the, the, the digits are fine. Um, uh, so it'll go this way, and it will come around. We still haven't achieved I, and we still haven't achieved M, and that's what Mason's next little bit is artfully designed to secure. 
Um, and uh, with alacrity, he achieves the goal. Um, and it comes down here because the next time it's percent and it's two things which, which are not valid hex digits. And so it falls this path down to I and then uh, following, following those being consumed, you've got, okay, you've got an A. So once again, it's gonna go down here. It's doing F the second time, but what the heck. Um, and we go B and we go M and things are done and the birds chirp and the sun is rising. And, uh, it's a nice day. Yeah. There's a bug if you end the percent. Precisely. Precisely. This is what I was going to ask next. This is unsafe code. Why is it unsafe? Well, it's it's just consuming these characters after the percent sign, oblivious to whether or not the string is ended. And maybe it's a zero terminating character. And then who knows what the next thing is. It's reading into memory, which is not allocated, maybe. And, you know, the sun is sad and the trees are glad. <laughs> and the birds have flown south or whatever. And, uh, and you know, things tremble and empires fall. Um, There's a joke when I was your age. Um, I think I actually saw it while working on the Excel project. Yeah, I think it was in that office. It said, Rome fell because of a null pointer exception. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it wasn't an exception, a null pointer bug. Oh, they, they, they didn't know how to handle null, and, and so that caused them to collapse. That's not true. Um, OK, so in any case, this is unsafe code. Mason, you're exactly right. And this is sometimes what reasoning about this testing gets you to think about. So that string, does that achieve state coverage? Most emphatically, yes. Um, I would view it as a, a very nice, very nice test case. One might even say it approaches an exemplary one. Is it the shortest? Sorry? It's off by one character. Off by one character. What character could we eliminate here? In Sorry? Either A. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, either A could be eliminated. A. Um, and uh, and it would still, it would be shorter yet, right? But there might be another variant of this that would show the hidden bug, right? For example, if you didn't have this, right? Um, and it gets you thinking about that. It gets you thinking about how the logic works and it might allow you to spot, well, wait a minute, what if it ended here? How does it know there's any more characters to consume? This is consuming two more characters without even saying, are they there? Right? Um, okay, so is it possible to have something shorter than, so this is the Masonian, the Masonian case. And the, the Masonian case plus, um, it's sort of the, 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 the shorter Masonian case um, uh, is, is just something like that, right? Are these particularly privileged? No, I've taken liberties, right? I did 2-0, that was arbitrary. As long as it's valid hex digits in here. Um, do these, Exhaustively exercise it? No. No, there's, I mean, it's not plugging in all possible values for these, and in general, that's impossible. But it is achieving, it's gotten to each place, because if there was some place here it had a, you know, divide by zero error, unless you reach that block, you can't be said to have seriously exercised it. I mean, how do you know it doesn't blow up there, like in the default case? Is this saying that? It's exhaustively tested this, that it works with all strings? No, exactly what Mason was saying. That's like Mason plus plus. Um, it, it, it points out that, that if, if we had left these exclamation points, or even one of them off, bad things could happen. Bad things can happen. One, it will read into zero. Um, two, it will read into un, uninitialized memory, which 
is, a, is, ladies and gentlemen, I will confidently tell you it's a bad thing with a capital B and a capital T, okay? Um, true when I was young? True, ladies and gentlemen, when I am old. Mm -hmm. Especially if you accede to Charles Simone's claim, see now and see forever. Um, okay, in any case, um, moving right along, um, is this the shortest? Is the Mason plus the shortest one that will exercise all these, all these paths? Does anyone want to suggest anything that you believe would be shorter? Mason. You can truncate the theory of exclamation points and just hold whatever the memory doesn't call it textual. And then therefore it still hits that true branch and it's still shorter. Yeah, so so you might, but um, what that gains in brevity it loses in robustness. Um, so I, I would not recommend it. It's sort of playing Russian roulette with your testing, right? Um, which is not the, a fun thing to do as the minutes tick by to the 371 deadline, nor I would note the minutes to the stakeholder presentation. Um, so, so you're right. I mean, possibly you could, you could play past and loose and say, we know C, and it, it's a zero terminated thing, and we could cut off one more. But this is not the way robust software is built by, by logical brinksmanship of, of what the hell you can test one last thing. After all, you know, generally more testing is good. Okay, is that the only string that's written there that, that will test it that way? No, there's many others, but they all have to have a requisite structure. So they need, they need at least what? They need at least a plus to go that way, right? Um, and they need at least a percent sign where it's got some valid digits, and they need a percent sign where it hasn't. So, so Mason is just bang on here. And, and they need a character which doesn't have a percent in front of it, right? So that will steer it through all these, and then the strings must end. So you don't have to go this way, right? To M. That's state coverage. It achieves state coverage. Now, if you want to achieve state coverage with your test suite, which is generally the goal, it's not to do it necessarily with one test, you can have multiple, multiple strings. So you don't have to do it all in one string. And for some algorithms, it may not be possible to do it all in one string. Uh, there may be some state dependent thing where, if it remembers, if I was there before, I, you know, um, I, I'll block out all these these later edges or what have you. Um, so, in general, you might you might prefer to break this up. Give me two strings that would achieve the excellent coverage of both Mason and Mason Plus of the Masonian cousins. Anyone? What, what are, how about if we want to do two strings? What would be equally good? Give me two strings that collectively cover that. Yes? You just split it between the A and the percent, the first percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just divide them up like that, right? You've got one string that's plus A, and another string that's just percent, two O, two, in this case, it's really easy to do. For some algorithms, it won't be because there's kind of history dependence, you know, depends what I saw earlier, and it's a little bit more gnarly to divide them up. But in many cases, we can test with fewer, a longer sequence of inputs that it exercises, say, more use cases in sequence, or several different test cases which exercise um, a subset. Which do you think would be better? Think about, um, maybe it's, it's, it's on the Oculus, um, and you're trying to exercise some functionality, um, of several different areas of functionality. Would you want to do a long sequence or a shorter? Or think about um, the timeline app. Would you want to do you know, a whole sequence of things where you, you know, go and you select which things are, you load data in, and, 
which things are to be displayed, and then you end up changing the axis, I don't know, and, and you end up um, um, altering, you know, the type of data or what have you um, that you have, maybe, maybe you say, okay, use this as another time column. Would you rather do it one long string of, of actions, one long string of input, or several small ones? Um, I see many hands. Um, some are attached to bodies, and indeed to heads, which have participated previously. So I'll, I'll first lend the floor to someone who has not yet participated in this session. So, um, I was going to say for, for us, for the timeline specifically, it actually makes sense to do not just individual um, smaller tests, um, perhaps pairwise, pairwise tests, but also due to some of the, uh, the way that our architecture works mm -hmm. and or with scaling numbers and everything, mm -hmm. it makes sense to also do a longer set of tests to make sure that, um, say, due to floating point things, that it doesn't go too far off base and that things don't just all of a sudden start to spread apart or break because someone's been using it first. Great, great. So, so Mesa, um, as is not unusual for him, um, compressed a couple salient points into that answer. Um, there's actually reasons to sometimes favor several tests. And there's reasons to favor sometimes sequences. Give me an advantage that would come through having a long sequence. Well, he just gave me one, right? There might be accumulations of, of, of error or floating point computation inaccuracies, numerical precision issues which accumulate over time. Quite right. Um, uh, so maybe one action earlier ends up leading to things that make it more likely a problem will come out later. And so if you only test things in isolation, you're missing those interaction effects that may prove really problematic for a real user, where you have long sequences. And similarly, there may be you know, long sequences that will exercise problems um, because they've gone through this loop many times. Like maybe initially it works fine, but once you've gone through it once, you know, a pointer's been altered, if you go through it again, it blows up, right? Or maybe this pointer's now been set to null, um, and, it, and it can blow up. Um, so that's exactly right. Long sequences may bring out certain types of errors. Give me an argument that sometimes, though, you, you don't all only want to use long sequences. Why might you want to use a, a shorter sequence sometimes? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Will, William. certain types of problems from having a shorter string that are obscured even by, by longer strings. So I, I like that. It, it, a shorter string that terminates sooner may cause problems. There's an additional one that a consideration that you didn't mention, but both those points are very good points, very salient points. So um, number one, there may be times shorter sequences by very virtue of being shorter, ending sooner, might exercise things that aren't otherwise exercised. Um, uh, and secondly, you know, if a test case fails, it's a, if it's a god-awful long sequence, what caused it to fail? It's not clear. Could have been something anywhere along the way. It just failed. It, it bombed out. It gave the wrong result. Or it crashed, right? Um, you know, it's not, it's not clear why. It's kind of a, you have to start probing into it. Whereas if you have short sequences, that one succeeded, that one succeeded, this one failed. Boom. We have, a, we have suspicion one. We've sort of teased it out in a, in a more controlled way. And there's another thing, too, that sometimes if a whole sequence fails, it obscures what would have happened if it had continued on. Sometimes one thing failing can prevent you from seeing other defects. And in fact, I think in the bug party that was run between one of the groups and um, uh, 
uh, lack of sleep and indeed of, of, of my growing age addles my brain so much. I can't remember which group it was. Um, uh, but what I will note is uh, that one of the groups had noted, I think there were certain, in the, in the bug party, there were like five defects found total. Um, is that group one? Five defects found total that gave rise to many faces, just as gems have many faces in Roman mythology. So it is that uh, these five bugs gave rise to, uh, uh, to, to you know, many faces and, uh, uh, and, and those might in turn block discovery of other problems. You know, if logging doesn't work, if you have authentication problems, you can't even log into your system, who knows what defects may lie beyond, right? Um, so, so sometimes longer things uh, can block discovery of other defects that independent test cases will gather. So, for, so again, it's an argument to at least some shorter test cases. But the truth is you want to mix. If, if you don't have a long sequence, you may find the buildup of problems here doesn't show its face until, you know, until you're doing manual testing. And long sequences will sometimes show memory leaks or you know problems associated with uh, loose pointers that otherwise would go hidden. Yes, Will? Um, when you're implementing like, longer sequences like that, like if you wanted to do something mm. like Mason string there that hits every state along the way, yeah. how exhausted would you want to be in basically mixing up? This is the first state I hit, this is the second state I hit. Like basically doing every permutation or combination of yeah. It's, it's a good question. I mean, that would be, again, thoughtful attempt at testing it, taking advantage. This is glass box testing, right? We're, we know the implementation structure. And what you're talking about is instead of just throwing random strings at it, like, like saying, OK, we're going to pick. These are kind of equivalence classes of strings, right? We're going to pick a string which, which first goes this path with D, G, H, and so on. And another one which goes instead first with um, no unusual character. And another one which first goes with plus to see if it brings up. You could do that. And let's put it this way. It would have, I would expect, more than a random chance of showing an error. <laughs> After all, um, you know, maybe there are characteristic bugs that only come up when you do that the first time. So, you know, I think that would be uh, worthwhile uh, to, to think about. It does require some time, and that time has an opportunity cost. It's probably taken away from another test. But um, if you are concerned because there's some obvious ordering issue, if, you know, one block depends on some, some subtle ways on what you previously hit, that might be really worth doing, trying different permutations, not of of characters just randomly, but of these kind of these building blocks. Because really there's, and that's what this brought out, right? That Mason chose this artfully. And he did so with with uh, with reason. Right? He he identified, okay, there's kind of these building blocks. Like this percent two characters is an important building block, and there's two variants of it. One legit, one illegitimate. And he wanted to to test that. The, the plus is another kind of different building block than an A. Whether it's A or Z or H, you know, it's kind of immaterial, but it shouldn't be plus or percent. That was the salient point. And, you know, I think at the least you want to do something like that. And if, you, if there's funky ordering things, you know, if one thing depends on its function or what you did earlier, I would think that rearrangements might be really good. Okay, so like you're saying. In this case, you know, I, I'd be a little bit skeptical that creating test cases that super consciously exercise this first versus that would, would pay off just because um, there's not a lot of heavy dependencies of one thing on an earlier thing. Um, but if there were, then I would do it. You know, this only works if we had hit those two blocks previously and maybe, maybe trying different permutations would be useful, okay? Um, 
Okay, um, so that's that's node node coverage, and um, you know we could have many sequences the, that that exercise it or one. These are these were single strings, Mason and Mason plus, but but we could flip them and and you know have have different things, right? Um, so state coverage is the simplest and the weakest one, and what's the problem with it? Give me a give me a problem with state coverage. What? So this is great. Without this, you're not going to be able to find certain types of bugs. But what does this leave on the table? What thing does this not catch? Yeah, imagine. Failures. Sorry? Transition yeah, transition failure. So, so give me a concrete case. Like um, if we talk about a transition failure, what? Can you, can you give me a case where the issue is not whether we reach a block, but it has something to do with the transitions involved. Maybe it's L. When we enter L, we know not whence it came, right? We don't know from what previous block it came. Give me several blocks um, that, that might have preceded uh, L within the journey uh, of this. What might have preceded L? Yes, please. Well, first thing that comes to mind is uh, in, in P, uh, there's Right. Um, so, so that can actually that could definitely occur in G. And so, if a previous if a previous block is reached, it may lead to sort of um, it may lead to spurious behavior down here. Mm -hmm. um, that is um, that ends up causing problems. Like it's going to be reading an E because e, because what will happen? <laughs> this is pathologic. This is pathologic. Because you know what will happen? If you had, oh, this is horrible. This is horrible, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it gives me the shudders as a C programmer. I've written a couple hundred thousand lines, probably 300 or 400,000 lines of C code, C, C++ code in my life. And, and this, this like gives me the willies. Um, uh, so, so suppose I have, Suppose I have this. Um, yeah, even that's enough. What what will happen? Okay, so it'll, it'll go through here, the plus, and then go down here. We checked out the E, L, B, A, of course. Uh, we come down again, right? Um, and then A, yeah, sure. Um, we do A, right? Um, we go up, okay, we come down again. And then we do the percent. Um, okay, no, no. Go to go to here, and then it starts reading. Oh, just we don't need that. I could have done it for the first time, um, but it will start reading. Okay, so it's actually going to read this um, this exclamation point, and then what is this going to read? No Zero. Yeah, and it's going to advance e pointer. Mark my words. And and then where will it fall? Whither will it go? It'll be past the uh, it'll it'll go to I because it will say oh, I got a bad thing, right? It'll go to I, it'll flow through, it'll say okay equals one, which means it's bad, <laughs> horrible. Um, it'll flow down and then it'll come up here and, and guess what? What what will it do here? It'll follow right. It will. E pointer is pointing beyond the null character. So now it's going to be reaching into, into like off the edge of the world, right? It's going to be reaching beyond the allocated zone. And it's going to start, start looking for characters that are un, in the unallocated region. And looping here, who knows how long? It's going to be looping till potentially, I would even venture till the cows come home. Um, and and that's where the chickens come home to roost because eventually it may run into a seg fault, right? It'll have a seg fault and it will it will flame out of it. 
in a most unpleasant fashion. Yes. I think I gave this example because I ran into exactly this in 332 with uh, my like uh, our, our our shell emulator uh, because I could get you know individual tests would always pass because the newly allocated strings just had blank memory at the end of them. But after you got about 20 or 30 commands, you're pretty much guaranteed to run into yeah. reused memory and get a whole bunch of garbage. So yes, um, you and I, Mesa. We have walked some, we have trod some similar paths. Mm. And um, um, I regret to hear of your chastening experience, but, but rest assured, you have not lived it alone. Um, so so I, I sympathize. Um, so so, so those, those problems happen, and this gives me the willies, but what sort of problem might happen in a state. This is still trying to reach each state, and we need to do that. But is it possible that in a given state, um, sometimes it could work and sometimes it couldn't, depending on what transition was taken into it? After all, L here is preceded by H or I or E. Is it possible? Um, to, um, yes, yeah, E, I, and H, right? Um, uh, and is it possible in general a block for some of its predecessors might work, and for some it might not. Yeah, in general it is. Like maybe, maybe one predecessor will assign a variable to a null value, and it gets down and it reads a null value and all hell breaks, so it, it blows up. And another predecessor um, that it will assign that variable to something non-null, and it will fall through to this block and things will be fine and the, the flowers will bloom, right? Figuratively speaking, of course. Um, but the point is that depending on your predecessor, depending on and whence you came, um, you, you might, might, might or might not have a problem. If P head here is set to null, and you're down here, and you assign to P head, this head pointer for a linked list, if you have reached this point through this conditional, Consequent of this of this if statement, um, chances are you're fine as long as the calloc returned a legitimate point was able to allocate memory. By contrast, if this if statement, if this if conditional were false, will this cause problems? Yeah, it will cause big problems because it's null up here, and bad things will happen. Um, so, in short, it's not a matter often. Vulnerabilities are not just, you know, does this code work or not? This this statement, this state, this node in the diagram. It's does it work under the conditions by which we got there? And I think you know, Mason was anticipating this earlier, where he was talking about you know potential loop. For example, maybe it's an unsettling thought, but maybe the code after the loop will work for a certain number of times in the loop, but not for others. And, and we're going to have to reason about this. So here, what I'm trying to show here is that state coverage still is a big test gap. It's, there could be a fundamental, fundamental vulnerability like this one, where we can assign to a potentially null pointer that we wouldn't find if we just say, our criteria of success, our metric of thorough testing, is whether or not we execute a given statement. That's not going to be enough. We might execute this p head equals p tail and it passes swimmingly because we've only executed, the one time we execute it, we have to do a fall on the if. But if we ever were to execute it later without going through the if, it blows up in the user's face. Right? So we need to look beyond, for reasonably thorough testing, statement coverage or or uh, node coverage is is too too weak, um, uh, and it's it's much better than not reaching each statement. Don't get me wrong, reaching each statement, each node is incredibly better than not reaching each node, because you can't even pass the red face test and say yeah I've yeah I, I tested it you know every every point was reached. But it's kind of a, a poor man's solution, a poor, poor solution. So, you know, often we're interested in edge coverage. We're interested not just in 
where do we reach, but how do we reach it? How do we reach it? Because cancellation by the user might work when they cancel having not yet paid, but perhaps it doesn't give them a refund if they cancel having been paid. And if all we were testing, it, the only scenario we tested was cancellation before they paid, we wouldn't have found that. Okay, so next time we'll be talking about edge coverage and prime path coverage, which further addresses Mason's comment about this issue of the loop. And we'll see how we can execute that loop, how we can reason about that loop without exhaustively executing it. That is not an option. And as Shakespeare said in King Lear, through the voice of the king, that way lies madness. Um, you can't execute things exhaustively, but what you can do is, is, is test them judiciously. And that requires more than just saying we hit the loop once. It requires reasoning about maybe several iterations of it. Okay? And we'll see a principled way to approach that with prime paths next time. Um, but the fundamental thing is we need to think not only about the statements we reach, but the context by which we reach them to achieve a higher level of coverage, to achieve a level of edge coverage that achieves everything node coverage does but something greater yet. And with those words, ladies and gentlemen, I will close this session. I wish you the finest of uh, break weeks, um, but I, I look forward to seeing many of you uh, tonight during the marking session where we can dialogue about your ID3s. Thank you very much. And for those who are out due to sickness, I wish them a fast recovery. Um, I, I hope they do not view this video even yet from their sickbed.